man. I can tell we've got the banter going here today. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll kick this off now. Nick, welcome. Nick is the first cab off the rack. Nick Lincoln said, Alan paid me to attend. That's good to hear. Uh, there's been rumors that he's been paying for Twitter followers, which is absolutely not true, but uh, paying for, for, for webinar um, watches, is, that's definitely out of my playbook. So nicely done. Uh, ben from Leeds and Alan didn't pay me to attend. I went to university in Sheffield, spent many much time in Leeds. I love it. Dublin, Ireland. Uh, it was me. Uh, is it Dara? 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 Uh, I'm going to, I apologize. My mum would be um, turning in a grave if she was dead, but she's not. I've been following Alan for a long time. He's a great man and an advocate for real financial planning. Thanks for, thank you very much for coming. Marcus follows the trap pack and Lick, uh, Lick Ninkin from Australia. Uh, Ross is in Poland. He follows the trap podcast and on LinkedIn. Jonathan J says he's Liverpool. You came at Alan a few months ago for a beer. Uh, Perfect. Look, we're going to kick it off. But as I mentioned, some of you kind of, first of all, I want to know where you are. We've got some people in Dublin. We've got some people in Leeds. Jason's in Plymouth. Mentions he admires Alan's work and the rest of the trap guys. Hey, if you don't want to be on here, what's the, Lee, okay, we we won't worry about that. Cool. We've got a really good um, crowd today. We've got Greg coming in. Welcome. Uh, who else? Oh, Stuart. Thank you, Colin. You know, let's just jump into it because there's a lot to cover. Um this story, I'm going to turn my, my camera on so we can sort of eyeball each other a little bit as, uh, along the way. There we go. So this story kind of begins actually in, uh, in about 2015. And at the time, uh, I was on the cusp of just releasing a book. Uh, and in particular, just starting a, a working group, which ended up becoming the program that I run today, which is uh, Practice Evolution. And I, I put an article uh, on Twitter, ironically, uh, and I got this this comment from this this gentleman, Alan Smith, who was in the UK, and he, we, we ended up having a bit of a conversation, and we and we spoke about everything. He told me about his business, and I told him about what I was doing, and he was incredibly supportive and and social. And strangely enough, we we continued the conversation over the years, and we check in. Sometimes it was one year, and sometimes it was sort of after about a couple of years. But uh, what ended up happening? Sure enough. Uh, about two years or three years ago, probably close to three years ago, I started to notice this real uptick in in the just not just the the the, the frequency of his posting on Twitter and on LinkedIn, but in particular the quality. And you know, if you've done marketing and uh, financial advice, any sort of particularly digital marketing, you know, finding that sweet spot between sharing information that is factual, accurate, and and really goes deep on on the area of money and investment and all all financial advice around it. And, and really capturing people's uh, attention and being readable and engageable, it's not an easy thing to do. But I remember just following him and watching him get better and better at it and realizing how much he'd really uh, excelled and really cracked it. And you know, as if you know a bit about Alan and, and you've been following, you'll know how good his content is, particularly you know, when I started finding out about his podcast and, and those guys who are on here, uh, phenomenal work, great stuff. Andy Hart as well, funnily enough, is another contact that I've known from a long, long time ago. Uh, who I made contact with. And I wanted to get him on board and really talk about not just how he's done this digital thing and and also the podcasting thing, because I'm I'm a fan of podcasts from way back. I've got my own podcast and I love the medium, uh, but also how he managed to build a business behind it. So that's what I wanted to get stuck into today. As always with these um, these sessions, it, I want a bit of interactive. So as we're talking, I've got a bunch of questions, but if there's something you want to know or, or, or a, a question you want me to ask or, or something you've come here to find out, please uh, jump in the, in the chat box. Let me know what it is and I will do my best to, to pull out the questions along the way and uh, yeah, and all the rest of it. So without any further delay, Alan, are you there, mate? I'm here. I'm How here. the hell are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, very well. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, or good evening to our Australian friends. Um, we're not going to talk. You're you're not Australian, are you, Stuart? We're not going to talk about the ashes. I'm Scottish. We can, we don't really... we can talk about the ashes all you like. But I, <laughs> I, I'm actually, I was born in the UK and I came out here when I was very young and then I went back to England and sort of spent from about 13 to 22. And to be honest, when I came back here, whenever the ashes came up, I'd always get the same question. It was like, which side are you on? And it, was, it wasn't yeah. just like, who are you supporting? It was like, where's your allegiance? So I just stopped answering the question and, and I, I've sort of stayed away from it. But uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing will generate a good bit of, uh, you know, traditional banter than, than the yeah. ashes, oh, particularly yeah. this series, right? It's been, it's been full of it. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. yeah. Nice, nice to see you. Yeah. It's great to see you. And I, I, as I said, I went back in my inbox and I realized that our conversation has been, been ongoing for many, many years. And it's been great to see you sort of doing what you're doing. It's been super impressive. 
Mate, you've just got back. You've just come back from up north, right? Yeah, I was in Scotland for a week, um, and uh, yeah, I was I was uh, abroad. Just taking, I've taken some time off, taken nearly a month a month off work, which uh, is really good. And I'm just just got back uh, to work kind of yesterday. A um, bit rusty, but um, kind of raring to go. Quite a lot of things on the go right now. A lot of projects uh, to be done. So um, yeah, kind of, you know, positive and quite exciting times for us you- in the profession over in the UK. Do you find being able to take a lot of time off has had an impact on your productivity or, or, or what you produce when you're back in, or, or is it is it just kind of same, same, but less? No, I, I think it's good. You know, I've always been a fan of the idea of kind of rest and rejuvenation, recharging the batteries, all that sort of thing. Uh, and it's obviously, it's a challenge um, when you're running a business, particularly in the early days of running your business, when you kind of are, as I was in the early days, I kind of was the business. And therefore, it's very difficult to get any time off. And I was constantly... Um, you know, just checking my emails and checking my phone and all and so on. But I'm able to now. Um, I've got a you know a pretty you know solid business, which is kind of self managing. You know, a great team of people here, so I can get some good time off without worrying or con- concerning myself too much about um, you know business as usual and things going on within the company. Right, it's living the dream. That is <laughs> trying, um, doing our best. We've got so much to get through, and so I'm just going to dive in because if I think if we if we if we if we don't get some some pace on this we're going to end up missing out on some stuff but i want to just kick it off by sort of saying you know when people ask you that question you know what do you do or how how do you present you know capital asset management and your role and how do you describe it um well that that's evolved over the years as well i'm so there's, there's there's two aspects there's two aspects to that um one is um in terms of what what we do as a business, one big lesson that I've learned over the years is um, simplicity is really important. You can get, and I've historically sort of got in the weeds of all the complexities of the work that we do, but fundamentally, we've now distilled everything down. I think communication is really important. Uh, we've all got the curse of knowledge, right? We all, we all understand kind of the, the job we do and the impact that it can have in the lives of the clients that we work with. And it's very, you know, it's very pro- productive and it's very, we can be very influential, and positively so in the lives of our clients. So uh, in terms of what we do, we've distilled it all down. We do three things, and that's all we do. Yep. Um, and it's the three Ps, plan, portfolio, and partnership. That's the, like, right. When I explain that to clients or prospective clients, we do three things. They kind of get it instantly. That's using the power of three, which is you know a, a good communication technique. We've got the ability to understand three things, probably not too many more, but that's exactly what we do. You know, we, 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 we build a model, we build a plan. Where are you today and where, you, where do you want to get to and where do you want to stay yep. in the future? Uh, that we then fuel that plan with the appropriate resources. We optimize, we organize and optimize your resources now and in the future in order to give you the highest possible opportunity of achieving the plan, the, you know, the, the, the sort of idealized life that you've determined within the plan. Yep. And the and the third and in our, in my opinion the most important part of that sort of proposition is the partnership is the ongoing relationship the the role that we play in the lives of our clients as a trusted advisor um a confidant uh, a sounding board and you know just somebody the only probably the only person in their life that kind of outside of their family that you know cares for their you know future the financial future, the financial security of the family as much as they do, uh, and has got the experience and knowledge to help them um, implement and achieve that. So those are the three things that we do. We explain that to clients, and they get it pretty pretty quickly. Yep. I love um, threes. As, as, a, as a coach, I work with one said, he says, two's not enough and four's too many. Three's yeah. just right. I love it. Exactly right. So, so when, when did your journey begin? Like, when did you start down the route of, of um, starting the business that would eventually become capital asset management? Uh, 2004. So okay. we are, you know, next year will be our 20 year anniversary, and we're quite a different business, I suppose, to the one that uh, that started. Uh, I, I, I always say I've really only had uh, two jobs in my life. I spent the formative part of my career um, at a large, what well, is a large asset management company. Now, um, and I was the role. I, I don't know if you have that. You probably do have it in, in Australia. It was. It's called a broker consultant. Basically, I I was representing the brand, the company, and going and kind of knocking on the doors of intermediaries, of financial advisors, banks, accountants, and promoting our products and services uh, yeah. in competition with our, you know, the, the other um, insurance companies, fund managers, asset managers, and so on. And I learned an awful lot during that period. I was there for fourteen years, so it was enough wow. time to really really understand 
um, you know, our industry. And what I, what I did over the years was I kind of cherry picked, you know, dealing with dozens of different financial advice companies, you see, you know, the good, bad, and ugly of all, all sort of practices. And, and, you know, and then you really did. And some days, some of the, you know, the, the ugly was, um, was, was pretty prevalent. <clears throat> Some of the things I saw, and I've always been based around uh, London and central London. And what I did over the years was identify, you know, what I would consider to be best practice. There was, let's say, you know, firm A had a fabulous client proposition, how they described, how they articulated their value model. Yep. And firm B had a really interesting investment strategy and firm C had, you know, the the, the different ways of recruiting and and so on. And I I sort of, I always had this idea, if I could cherry pick all the very best parts of a business and kind of assemble them together. Uh, you could have this sort of optimal financial advice business. And that's, that's what I, I aim to do. And, and I still stand by pretty much everything that I, I learned back in those days. For example, I'm not a believer in, a, in, in, ma- in, in huge corporate businesses. I don't think, and there's so many examples now in the UK of large corporates, um, you know, big national advice brand businesses, and they are um, you, they don't enjoy the same degree of success. Maybe as, I like the idea of a boutique business. Um, maybe... Four, four, five, six advisors, something like that, with a you know a fantastic support team in place, optimized technology, great client proposition, very focused on a particular. I'm a believer in in sector specialisms and niche, and uh, you know identifying um, the particular types of clients that you want to work yep. with, and understanding where their pain points lie, and optimizing to um, you know to relieve their pain, I suppose. And so that's that's really what we. We did. I didn't really have a, a grand plan. I didn't write a business plan, but I kind of knew what good looked like uh, as a business. And we've just evolved that over the years, bit by bit. I mean, you know, nineteen years is a long time to be in business, uh, really. But it's just, it's just, been, it's been simply, it's been organic growth over the time um, and to, to the position that we are are now. And so we're, you know, we're just we're in good shape. We're we're a, a successful independent boutique business. We're to use our language over here. We're a, uh, independent firm, chartered financial planners, and looking at the exchange rate this morning, we've got about a billion Aussie dollars under management across about 250 clients. Uh, so it's you know we're, we're we're in a nice place, but we can certainly talk about my my own journey because when I start, well, I literally started as a sole operator, one man band. Um, right, that's 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 what I was from day one. And I tell you what, it was a very steep learning curve. I thought, having dealt with a lot of financial advisors over the years, I thought. How hard could it be? It looks pretty simple. All they do is sort of you know, show up, meet a few clients, flog a few policies. Um, and it's, it, was, um, it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be when I got started. And I literally learned on the tools, day by day, learning as I go. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in just consistency. I'll tell you what, I showed up every day, just every single day. I showed up, did my best. And we just grew organically, word of mouth, you know, one client at a time. And uh, as I say, we, we grew. When I got particularly busy, I went out and recruited and brought in other advisors and brought right. in other staff and organically grew over a period of time. How long, um, did it take, how long did it take you to go from sole operator to a business that you'd say, you know, it was, I guess, yeah, it was the point where you realized you weren't driving everything. Uh, it was about three years. Okay. I would say it was, it was a few years in. I, mean, I, was, I was pretty busy from day one. There was just, I was always, there was lots of opportunities. I think there still are. There's loads of opportunities for growth. And I was just focused on growth. I was focused on building the business. Um, you know, I'd read, I'm, I'm a great um, consumer. I read a lot of books. I list, I mean, probably not so many podcasts in those days, but I, I kind of, re- I'm a student of our profession. I'm a student of, of trying to understand behavioral psychology, of sales, things like that. And I just believe that we did a really good job. I, I knew that we helped people. I've got my own, I probably haven't got time to, uh, to go into it now, but I've got my own personal journey, my background journey, sort of growing up in Scotland and sort of some of the trials and tribulations of, of growing up with, um, you know, parents that were very kind of business or my dad's particularly entrepreneurial and the, the roller coaster ride that you go through yeah. financially. And so I understand the impact of understanding finances within a family. And I, and I just felt that we could do a good job. And I was kind of, I didn't sort of articulate it particularly well then, but I was very, I was very driven by, you know, mm. by values and and um, and a mission. Really, I just wanted to help help people. And I think that's that's what we did. We showed up every day, got you know, was successful in word of mouth and referral. Referral strategy was our biggest thing. We just often we seek speak to a client and they'd refer us to to somebody else. And I think in those days I was quite focused on technology as well early on, which yeah. was quite dif- different. You know, I was trying to sort of harness the powers of tech 
from day one, and that was differentiating us from perhaps some of our competition that, at the that, time. That was that was the basis of how we started our conversation because I, I was the same. I was I, I, my my parents were both uh, self employed people, caused a lot of problems in the family as well. My mum was actually an Avon lady way back in the seventies. Um, but uh, I kind of had an experience in the tech startup space. And then I came back and right. started coaching some of this stuff. And I thought way back there, I was like, there's a real opportunity here. And you can kind of see where it's got to since there. It's it's kind of taken off. But I think it's if you're interested in that stuff, it makes it easier. So Yeah, exa- yeah exactly. But th- there was just the, going through the process, there was a the time, and I think I know you want to talk about it, um, uh, where I had to just kind of redefine my own role. Yeah. So, because there was the, there was one thing you said to me really stuck, mm. and I think you said I think I shared with the, uh, something that come from Dan Sullivan. Um, but you said if I look back at the things that I thought I wouldn't be doing today five years ago, if you told me that you won't be doing that, I would I would tell you that that but that's how I make my money, and that's yeah. a massive shift for a lot of people out there. Well, it, yeah, it, it is. I think you know, I, I'm certainly not unusual. I know a lot of people in our, in our profession and I'm not unusual in that, you know, I was no, it wasn't as if I had training as being a, um, you know, a business operator, a business owner and a managing yeah. director or anything like that. It was just, you, you know, you thought you, you kind of give yourself a job, didn't you? As opposed to create a business. That was the yeah. idea. You thought, well, well, I, I've, you know, there's a bit of opportunity here. There's some clients or prospective clients out there as long as i can meet up with people and i can build a relationship build rapport offer value then you know i can make a living mm. and do that and, you know for i read something the other day again I'm not sure what it's like in, in australia but uh, in the uk um 47 of the financial advice firms in the uk have one advisor in them so they're, they're sort of sole sole trader so half the market yeah. is, is a sort of sole trader advisor and um and that's, and that's, you know, that's absolutely fine. And, and I think most of them or all of them are, are successful and, and, and do a good job. But there's a difference between being a sole trader advisor and, and yep. having a, you know, a business, a boutique business um, that operates with staff and, and sort of operating models and all that sort of stuff. And, and really, the, the, the story is, is, is not complex. I was just, as a founder of the business, the person that had, I was, I was kind of the rainmaker, of course. All, all the, a lot of the client opportunities were coming to me. Yeah. Um, and, and I was on the tools. I was advising clients. I got to a stage where I had about 90 client families, but I was also trying to run the business. So I was also recruiting people and I was trying to do all the, the corporate stuff that you're supposed to do, like having, you know, quarterly staff appraisals and, you know, help develop members of the team and go out and recruit people. And then I've got responsibilities about, let's say, like the office lease and negotiating with landlords and you name it. So you've yep. got a massive shopping list of things that you're supposed to do, plus business development, business generation, and, and, and all that stuff. And you realize that there's not enough time in the day yep. to do, do all these things. And, and you know, I, I just started looking at, you know, I was just crazy busy all the time. I was just really, really busy yep. every single day, you know, long, long work days, long weeks. And I, I sort of reflect, I'm looking at our sort of revenue and growth, and I thought, Man, we are flatlining. We are just—we haven't grown in two or three years. Yeah, and I couldn't. It's, it's crazy now, but you know you can't see the wood for the trees because you're right in it and really, really busy. And I couldn't work out if I'm so crazy busy and we've got new opportunities. Why are we not really, really sort of shooting the lights out on our business growth? Yeah, and I eventually realized the problem. The problem was me. You know, I was, I was the, the bottleneck. I mean, we were, I was getting opportunities for you know, new prospective clients and literally not even getting back to them, not having the time to call them back. That, that was a, the, the sort of situation that we were in. And at the time, and I mentioned that I read a lot of books and I read a book called The E-Myth, which is quite a famous book, um, uh, Michael Gerber. Yep. And then the, the penny dropped. And I thought, yeah, you know, the, the E-Myth, is the, the E obviously stands for entrepreneur in that it's a myth. You know, if we think we're entrepreneurs, because we've got a business. Well, actually, we're not. We've, um, we've, we've given ourselves a job. Most, of, most people, uh, you know, according to the research that um, Gerber did for that book, most, most people who start a business, they're working for a larger co- company. They think to themselves, well, I can do this better. You know, tick, did it. Um, I don't have to work for somebody else and I can make the money myself and not have to, you know, hand over, you know, this to, to a boss or to a big corporate or company. So they go and set up in, in business by themselves. And then they realize quite quickly that they've got the worst boss in the world, i.e., themselves, <laughs> and they and and they're on the tools, and they're they're, yeah. they're still they're doing, they're doing the job, but they're doing everything. Then 
They're yeah. doing the job as, as the, the technician, as he calls it, you know, he's showing up and being a financial planner, but also a manager. You're also being, you know, having to run the company. You, you, you know, in my day, I had all, you know, I didn't, I didn't deal with staff or anything else in my sort of previous job, but now I had to deal with every aspect of running a business yeah. and this kind of this, this entrepreneur aspect of being a, you know, a growth driven business owner, entrepreneurial mindset, et cetera. That was just pushed out. You didn't have time to think about yeah. that. And so I really kind of reflected, well, how can I change this? Because if we, if I don't change, then we've pretty much flatlined in terms of growth. There is, I can't give any more hours to yeah. this. And you realize then, I think this is quite a common question or, or, or perhaps a fork in the road for, for financial advisor, financial planner, business owners, is that you either decide to say, well, I want to be, I love being a financial planner. I love the clients. And a lot of people do say this to me. I just love the client. That's the best part of the job. I love the client work. So that's fine. You carry on doing that, but you absolutely will have to hire. If you want to continue to grow, have to hire like a managing director, operations person. So, you know, other people to do those jobs, if you want to continue to grow, or you step into the role as the entrepreneurial founder and step away from the day job as showing up and delivering financial planning and financial advice to clients. Yep. And it was that I, so I chose to do the latter. I chose to step away from the day-to-day -day client activity. And it was a kind of, it was a tricky time, really. I, I've got, you know, a great bunch of people around me, some great advisors. Um, they, they've been with me for years and years. But I, the, I initially said, well, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of carve out, if you like, by revenue terms, the bottom 20, 20, 30% of my clients yep. and hand them, hand them across for day-to-day, -day, you know, looking after by my colleagues, which is going to free up more time for me to get involved in other more strategic issues. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And you realize, actually, those, um, those clients with, let's say, uh, less complex circumstances, more modest wealth, et cetera, they don't really take up that much time. So <laughs> I give away sort of 30% of my, my client and, and nothing much changed because a lot of the time was taken up by the larger clients, the more complex clients, the more demanding clients. Yep. So it was kind of put up or shut up. I'm going to have to do the, you know, take this seriously or not bother at all. So what I did is I, I effectively just passed across all my client relationships to my colleagues, to my other advisors. Now, I yeah. was speaking to people at the time who were saying to me, God, you must be mad. What if you do? Because a lot of advisors work from a kind of scarcity mindset. As 100%. As abundance mindset. But Absolutely. What if, they, what if they get these clients and then, then they take them and they leave and they leave you and take all the clients with them? I thought, well, you know, what if they do? If they do, they do. I hope they don't. I want to create an environment where no one ever wants to leave. Why would they want to leave if we've got a, you know, a great business here? Um, but if I don't do this, we're done. Our, our growth is we, I have no more to give, so we can't, you know, we can't progress as a business. So that's what I did over a period of time. And that's quite a tricky thing to do because you have got, you know, we are in a relationship business and, and saying to, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Clients, it's been lovely, you know, working with you, but I want to bring in Graham, I want to bring in Charles, I want to bring someone else. Um, can be a challenge, but it worked uh, pretty well, it's, actually. It's, in my experience, clients are more they're more focused on what they're going to lose. So if you say I'm going to I'm going to hand you over a relationship, they're not going. Oh, they they might go, I want this, but you can you can put that aside by saying we're growing. I'm going to be there in the background I'm still. But they're, they're, what their option really is, well, if I don't work with you, I've got to work with someone else, and that's a much less appealing offer than potentially yeah. still working with the business but having that contact. I want to ask you a quick question, Alan, because yep. um. There's a lot of businesses that might be listening to this and they'll be like, yeah, yeah I, I've already got, I've reached that point where I don't have enough time. And we can talk, let's park the resourcing issue, the hiring the right people, because we need to talk about that a little bit. But when I look at you, what you told me is when you started out the business, you, you were focused on a boutique practice with a niche focus. Yeah. And I'm guessing that you, are, you charge in such a way that you know gives you the ability to be profitable, Correct. Yeah, what we do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we spent we spent a lot of time looking at um, at things like. I mean, I didn't used to bother about this. We just, you know, you just you show up. But uh, over time, see the, the the role that I then step into over that time is much yeah. more of a kind of strategic entrepreneurial type role. Yeah. You do look at things like profitability, and you do look at you know value for money and a number of things, and you think, well, that's what that's what you should do. Yeah. That's what all businesses do. If you're running a you know a, a restaurant or a, any other business, you do look at. Where your target market is, who your audience is, you know what the profitability factors. Yeah. You, you, you try to you try to avoid cross subsidy. You try to avoid pay, take it on lost leaders, etc. But I think a lot of the financial planning profession is just you know see how it goes. We'll take on any clients. So <laughs> I evolved. It wasn't what I was doing from the beginning, but I did evolve over time once I created this sort of the, the brain space. I think to think about this stuff.
Paul Graham is the guy behind Y, Com- y Combinator, and he was the guy, one of the guys who started Dropbox and Uber. And he yeah. he was asked the question on a CNN interview, and it was a great question. He gave a really quick answer: "What's the biggest mistake startups or growing businesses make?" And he said, "Don't charge enough, because yeah. to get to that point where you can reinvest and 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 growth, you have to have enough profit, and that's when your fees need to be right." And I, I'm like, yeah. my feeling is when you got to the point you didn't have enough time. You know, your ability to hand off, carve out clients and hand off would have been impacted by your ability to invest in the right people to be able to, exactly. to support that. So, like, obviously, you're handing off. Tell me a bit about how you made sure you had the right people on board and you attracted the right people and trained them to be able to, you know, take over. You know, I'd like to say there was a bit of luck involved. You know, we, we you know, I just met bumped into people, met people. But I, I was just very clear. One thing is quite interesting, I think, about this profession from some of the, the war stories that I hear, some of the things I hear in the grapevine, is that there's a lot of broken promises made. People are offered various things. You join companies, join organizations. They're yeah. told, this is going to be wonderful. We're going to give you this. We're going to offer you that. And more often than not, they don't deliver it. And I'd like to think, you have to ask my colleagues about this, but I'd like to think I've delivered in every single promise mm. that I've made to them. And and I think that's important. And and I think it's important. I th- you know, you know, the, 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 the magic word is culture, isn't it? So I think I've created a a positive culture. We are you know values driven. We are trying to change the world and our or our little corner of the world. And I think if you attract like minded people, look after them well, give them autonomy, pay them appropriately above market rates, um, then you can you can attract and retain some some high quality individuals, but I do think, I mean, again, without going, without being a little bit, you know, without being too fluffy about it, you know, yeah. having a vision, having, having something that's differentiated. I think that's, that's an important theme that runs through a lot of the stuff that I think about and that I do. I've got a very clear vision about the profession, what good looks like, um, how we can optimize for our clients, yeah. uh, the value that we deliver, all those things. And, you know, it's it's like this the, the the saying sort of build your tribe. I've tried to build a tribe, a, tri- a tribe of like minded people. The advisors that I know and hang out with, they, they believe most of the same things that I do. Yeah. The team that I work with believes the same things, and and I think the clients believe the same sort of things, and and that's fine. But there's probably a lot of other people that, that think it's nuts. They, they they don't believe this at all, and that's absolutely fine. I think that's another lesson I've learned over the years is that we don't need to deal with everyone. You know, and the, yeah. you know, come back to this. Come back to this point. You know, we just there's a target audience that you know like what we do. You know, they enjoy and value what we do. So let's not try to persuade other people who don't really care about it or don't value it. So I think that's helped in terms of the, our my ability to attract high quality people. Yeah, and have them and have them stick around for long periods of time. I think that point about the vision is really really important because I mean everybody's happy when they've got something to look forward to, whether it's a holiday or you know whatever. Yeah. Uh, vision is just like that. It's basically a place you're going to get to sooner or later. And the more compelling it is, the more likely you're going to attract, I think, people who are w- going to be working for that. Because every once you reach your level of income, that's that kind of goes off. You're looking for the it's the next level is the people, and then it's the you know the the bigger picture. That's awesome. I think so, but but people also want to just show up and just kind of enjoy the the work they do. You, you don't want to, you don't want to have that sort of Sunday night dread. Oh God, I've got work in the morning. <laughs> I've got Monday morning. You, they, they want to feel you know kind of. You know, I'm looking forward to getting in, getting into the office or working from wherever and, you know, uh-huh. enjoying the banter with my colleagues and helping our clients. Um, it's, you know, this, it's, it's not always plain sailing, I'm not trying to pretend for a second that it is. There's loads of challenges along the way and they continue to be. But I think that's, that's the thing. Create a, great, create a positive environment, create a good workplace, look after people. It's basic stuff. You know, this is not rocket science. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. Two more questions on this I really want to know. The first one is about when you're training advisors to do what your clients have become used to from you, yeah. what is the number one thing you think you would advise someone to, to do? Or maybe the number one thing that you think most people don't do that stops them from succeeding? Oh, I mean, the, 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 the thing that I learned over the years is, and it's, it's nuts that this is a differentiator, but the ability just to, um, it's all about building rapport, but the ability to ask great questions mm. and, 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 you know, to keep, we did a lot of work on this in the past and we've got quite a mature team now. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, we've, we've learned a lot, but we could always keep, keep learning. But, you know, again, I was a, you know, a junkie for going on courses and learning about how, how to build relationships, how to build rapport. We are in the relationship building business. The rest of the stuff is, as Andy Hart says, is just plumbing. You know, it's just other stuff, but it's, you know, a, a, a fund, an investment, a product, a tax wrapper, but yep. relationship building. And how do you build relationships? You've got to build, you've got to build um, trust and you've got to build it quite quickly. 
Um, you don't have years to, to you know, to, to decide if, you, if you're going to work with a client. And one of the, the, the I think the best way of building relationships and getting people to engage with what you do is by being genuinely interested in them. And you've, if you sit down with somebody or with a couple for an hour and ask them some really meaningful questions and pause and reflect and go deeper with every question, um, that's, a, that's one sort of sure way. If you've got to be mm. authentic, you're, you're not using it as a, as a sales tactic. You've got to be genuinely interested in people. Um, but in order for you to be able to help them, you really need to understand. And you can come into a conversation or a meeting with preconceived ideas uh, about what they might be concerned about and realize 20 minutes in that you were completely wrong. And the only way you're going to do that is by asking some, some great questions. So we spent a lot of time earlier on just honing our skill set, identifying what are the great questions that we can ask. How can we you know, take that to the next level? And honestly, I was... Um, we just picked up some new clients, you know, the other day recently, and I was, and they, and they, they, they said to me early on, just, just to make you make it clear, we are, we are shopping around. This is really important. We're going to speak to a few different firms, and we, we always encourage people to do that. And they came back and they said, I want to work with you guys, us. And, I, and I, that's, so I thought, that's great. And I'm always intrigued as to what was the differentiator, what made the difference. And they said, you were the only firm that asked us about us. Everyone else went into sales mode quite quickly. Everyone else had a sort of a suite of products or portfolios and, you know, the color charts and graphs. They went into that quite quickly. And I thought that's quite interesting. If that, if a differentiator is the ability to sit down quietly for, with, with a couple for an hour and ask some great questions, well, I'm happy that <laughs> that's still a differentiator. It shouldn't be, but it seems to be. So I think that's one of the things that, that all our team is pretty good at. It's, I, I couldn't agree more. It's like put away the PowerPoint presentation. If you're giving a PowerPoint presentation during a first meeting, you've missed the point of the first meeting. It is to ask questions that make the client realize that you care. And secondly, diagnose what the issues are. So they go, oh my God, you've got it. That's the, yeah, the PowerPoint Absolutely. presentation is going to help you do that. And um, the other question I want to ask you this, and then we're going to move on to Twitter. Yeah. If you're going to go to, uh, on the growth journey that you have, and your ultimate goal is either to be the CEO who's not advising or a dedicated advisor. Other than other advisors, what do you think is, is, is a role within that kind of business that you need to absolutely get right? And if you don't have it, you're going to struggle to, to make the leap. Um, well, I, I've had to really re, um, redefine my own role. And it, again, it's, it's tricky. This didn't come easy to me at all. Mm. I mean, I find myself, when you, when you sort of move away from dealing with clients, when I've got a lot of clients on my roster, if you like, my calendar is mapped up. I've got, we've got annual planning meetings uh, you know, for all the clients, you've got 90 clients and you take a few holidays and you've got a few other things to do. Um, pretty much every week, you know, in advance, you know, on the, I've got four me client meetings next week and it's just, it's quite regimented. And you remove all of that from your calendar and you've got a, you've got a blank calendar, which is great in, in some ways, but then you've got to think, like, what, what the hell am I going to do uh, with this? So it, I, I did, it did take me a while to kind of adjust to the, the new yeah. role. Um, but I've reflected the, the and what I've determined is that I do four things. Um, and so the one is vision. You've got to keep having the vision and the vision can change over time and you're allowed to pivot. You're allowed to change your idea. You know, what, what an optimized vision looks like. But you've got to keep communicating it because people forget. You know, I learned, I learned you know, uh, uh, someone said to me recently, you've got to tell somebody seven times before they hear it for the first time. Just because I say something once yeah. Doesn't mean that that's in because everyone else has got a busy life. Everyone else is thinking what they're going to have for dinner that night or what they're doing at the weekend, and they haven't forgotten my grand. They've, they've forgotten my, you know, my my wise words and my vision. So understanding the vision and keep you know communicating the vision, and then you go to the next thing. Next part of that is strategy. How are you going to take this vision and actually make it real? So it's not just some fluffy you know silly concept that's never going to come in yep. into, into play. Um, then growth. If, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. So every business needs to be focused on growth. So what are we doing to move us from where we are as a business right now to where we want to be once you've understand the vision and the strategy? So vision, strategy, growth. And the last one is culture. It's just making sure that, the, that you know, everything is still operating um, internally and externally. That the people are happy that the, the Culturally, we've got, a, we've got a, a set of core values within the business that are we all living up to them, including me? I've got to lead from the front on that. That yep. sort of things I've got to show um, by my actions that I'm embracing the, the culture that we have all agreed is what we want to be. And that applies to our client relationships and how we show up in the world. So um, vision, strategy, growth, and culture. That's just that, that's my kind of North Star that I keep coming back to. And it sounds all very grand for, you know, we're, we're still a you know, tiny business. But I think without that, 
I think you can just lose the weight and you find yourself kind of going around in circles, not knowing what you're, what you're going to be doing. Yeah. And I think if I do that, and particularly the things around culture and meeting with a team and just having a coffee with colleagues and things like that is important, but I still am very, and, and this is probably will lead us into the conversation about growth and, and the, some of the stuff that we've done in, on the social media side of things yep. in the last year or two, but growth remains very important to us. So I'm just, on to, I'm trying to continue to optimize for growth, but not growth at all costs and not just doing things just because we can, but understanding mm. if all those things are aligned, if we've got our strong set of um, values and we've got a, a you know, clearly defined mission and vision, and it, it, we just need to understand how we can fuel that future growth. I love it. So let's talk about Twitter. Was there ever a point where you didn't think that social media or, or digital marketing was a, an avenue that uh, a financial planning practice should focus on if they wanted to grow? Yeah, 100%. I okay. mean, it, it literally was only the last... 18 months that I thought, look, I was, I'm, you know, classic entrepreneurial magpie, you know, anything new and shiny, I'll, I'll try it, try it out sometimes, see, see if it works. And I was, I was an early adopter of Twitter, but my God, I look, I was wondering what you were going to sh share there because I look back in my early tweets and it's just pathetic um, because, you know, when, when all these things first, you know, came to the fore, whenever it was 10, 15 years ago, um, everyone tries, tries them out, but all, you know, famously, you know, people are posting on Facebook and Instagram and stuff, you know, pick what I had for breakfast that day. And I just thought it was an absolute nonsense. Well, you know, I just didn't have time for that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and so I've never really participated in, in a lot of those other ones. I'm not really on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or anything, but, um, over time I began to understand it a bit mm -hmm. more. And it was, it was all, it was, it was, it was Twitter, which I, I kind of got into because I was just, you follow quite a few people out there. And I thought this is quite interesting um, because of some real value was being added by others, you know, various people all around the world were posting things. I thought that's helpful. That's really interesting. Mm. And I think, so I, the big, the catalyst, I've mentioned this before, the catalyst was, this was kind of a, I suppose it was a, a dividend of the whole, the lockdown period in COVID yep. or a couple of years ago. In the, yeah, I guess we all just had a bit more time and we're just, you know, <laughs> a bit bored and probably doing a bit more scrolling of social media during those, uh, those lockdown days. And I came across this um, uh, digital writing course called Ship 30, Ship 30 for 30. Yep. And so that was all about, uh, you know, it, it was a, you know, an online course where you were encouraged to write 30 brief articles I mean, yep. brief is like 250, 300 words or less. So pretty sure it's only a few a couple of paragraphs, really. But write 30 uh, in 30 days. So I thought, well, I've got a bit more time in my hands. Um, let's give this a go. So I did. I signed up for it. And, it's, it, it, and it really was the catalyst for me to understand. Because I, I just say up until that point, I thought, it's all a lot of nonsense. Your, your clients, your future ideal clients aren't even on Twitter. There's a load of other advisors all bickering over fee models or active versus passive or some other nonsense. Yeah. Um, and I just thought, uh, well, it's, it's worth it. I've got a bit more time on my hands. It's worth exploring. So it was a really good uh, course. And I do recommend it uh, because it what it did for me is it changed my mindset. Because if you've got to write something, and I'm the sort of person, I'm, I'm quite kind of obstinate if i'm going to sign up and you know if i've got to produce some article or some piece of writing mm. every single every single day for 30 days otherwise i fail then i'm going to do it you know and so put myself under pressure but it was good and i do think there's a lot of you know um, you know psychology that says if you do anything you know it's a habit for me do anything for 30 days if you if you go to the gym for 30 days or you fast for 30 days or do any number of things for 30 days you you kind of you rewire you you can brain neurons or whatever it is you kind of yep. you, you create a a new habit and that's what happened to me i did this i showed up every day for 30 days it's quite interesting because no sooner have you shipped your article for that day you're thinking right shit what do i do tomorrow i've got to think of something else to write tomorrow but it the, the, kind of rewires the brain because we're all surrounded every single day we are surrounded with ideas insights experiences that others would find valuable mm. and so i start just thinking about that. i think oh that was something that just happened that's quite interesting and you know, every one of us, everyone on this call, every one of us in life generally is sitting on a mountain of knowledge that other people would find super helpful, super valuable. But we've got, we've got this gift of knowledge. We think, well, I know that because that's just obvious. So why would, I, why would anyone care about it? And the reality is lots of people care about it. So I start, as I say, so I, I ran that uh, program for 30 days and I kept, and I've really kept it up pretty much mm. ever since. And so I'm a believer in making, you know, small experiments. 
let's be, let, let's see what happens uh, over time. But if I keep showing up, if I keep creating some sort of digital content, some sort of material, uh, some good might come of it. I don't know what might happen, but it'd be quite interesting. And I think what needs to happen, if anyone's interested in doing this, it's a mindset shift. I get people saying to me, I can see the kind of almost like mildly irritated. They say, God, you're, you're on Twitter all the time. Or I just, every time I go online, I see your, your stuff. <laughs> and, 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 you know, how do you find the time is the question. How do you find the time to do that? And, and the answer is you just, you just build systems. You just yeah. you begin to un- understand. And as you know, still, God, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I'm probably further ahead than some other people in the financial planning profession. Um, but I can tell you, I mean, I, I can, you know, we can unpack as much detail as you want, depending on the time we've got. But I can tell you that as, as I speak to you today, um, content, which, come, which, which does cut, cut across the whole thing. I really, I'm really only really active on two platforms, which is Twitter and LinkedIn. Yep. And, and I'm a, a host or a co-host of two podcasts. Yeah. And it's all done pretty effortlessly. Um, really, you know, you, basic systems allow you just to allocate some time to do this. Now, you know, and th- this kind of digital world that we live in now, you know, I've been various places around the world in the last you know, year or two, and every, you know, the show still goes on. I'm still delivering podcasts and things because you can sit by a, a swimming pool or whatever and just, you can write an article. You, you know, you've probably got more uh, experiences that you can share with, with the world. So that, but that is the single biggest source of our growth our new business business inquiries Single biggest. It's, yeah it, it's, it's like an ecosystem it's not yeah. what you come to, is, it, is it coming from twitter is it coming from linkedin it coming from all sorts of different places people kind of follow the breadcrumbs things happen um you know so, and, and you know the great thing about for example podcasts is that they kind of the well all this stuff exists out there uh, forever but podcasts in particular if somebody and this happened recently some somebody stumbles across a podcast that i'm like the, the my my kind of main business podcast is called bulletproof entrepreneur and it really targets targets the key issues of those people who are ideal clients of ours which are business owners and entrepreneurs particularly those who are scaling towards a successful sale and exit yep so some you know people stumble across it people are just sort of searching for entrepreneur podcast for example and there's, there's to my knowledge there's nothing else in the uk anyway that that talks about the issues that i talk about and the guests talk about so they find that they listen to a couple of episodes i think this is quite good and then and through through <laughs> through osmosis they find then my linkedin profile and they read a few things that i posted and they think this is quite interesting and it just builds up over yeah. time and the, the interesting thing about that as well in terms of when people contact us and look again we're not a big business but i would say and I, you know we've i've got the data to back this up we receive about on average not every single week but if i was to average out over the last six to six to twelve months one new inquiry from an ideal fit prospect per week so one yep. a week um which is more than enough for us to handle um and the good thing is versus the kind of old model of just getting kind of what I call website inquiries, people browse, people Googling financial advisor, and then, you know, they get in touch with you. <clears throat> These are people who are far more engaged because they've spent the time to consume some of the content. And as I say, you know, if 90% of the people who've, who've watched that or read some stuff think, oh, this guy is a nutcase. I don't want to ever speak to him. Then fine, because we, say, we, both, we all save ourselves a lot of time. So content becomes your natural filter. Yep. And by the time someone has reached out to us and said, Look, I've listened to a few of your podcasts, I've read some of your articles, you know, can we have a conversation? You're without being too like ridiculously salesy, but your kind of conversion rates are just tend, tend to be higher because they've already they've, they've, they've pre-sold themselves. I like what they say, I like what they've how they've described things, I like what they do. Um, can we have a, you know, I'm looking to get some help with my finances, I'm gonna sell my business next year, I'm retiring tomorrow, or whatever it might be. So we've done a lot of the, the groundwork has been done. And this yep. is what I, t- I talk about now. This is that digital arbitrage. The stuff gets created, but it's one, it's one to many. You know, so you think of an idea. I mean, my old days, I've always been about growth. And I've just worn out show, so much shoe leather over the years. You, know, you go and have you know, the proverbial cup of coffee with an accountant or a, a solicitor or something. And you talk about business development and sort of mutual client referrals. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's a lot of effort. You can't scale that. You can't no, scale no. coffee meetings with accountants or with anyone else. You can scale this stuff if you get it 
Right. And if you, if you use this as a natural filter, and I mean, I posted something the other day since, again, I can tell all these stories, but if, you back, if I back them with data, it's, it's more, more credible. On LinkedIn, for example, they, they produce quite a lot of good analytics. And the stuff the, that I've posted since I took this seriously, about a year ago, just over a year ago, there's been 3 million impressions or you know reads of, 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 oh, of i'm going to share stuff. that post now because i've got it right up in front of me there you go yeah so over three million in the last the last 365 days you know two and a half thousand percent increase which just shows you so before i wasn't doing anything i was just i wasn't posting pictures of my breakfast but i was just like you know not talking nonsense really but i decided to take it a bit more seriously since i did the ship 30 course and of course i've done other things as well to, to learn more about this stuff. And as I say, I'm far from an expert, but every day I learn more. But that's, that's, that's the kind of receipts, as they say. Uh, I mean, look at that, that one there, the, the Warren Buffett. That's just, again, it's not rocket science, but it's, it was quite interesting. A Warren Buffett post, and you can't, that was one of the ones in total has about half a million um, views. And what that did actually, if you look through the bottom, it's not here, but that, that, that Warren Buffett post, that then um, sowed some breadcrumbs. I, I don't have the whole thing though on that post, but um, because that then said, you know, that, that particular thing I discussed that you can't, that's a screenshot. So you won't be able to see the whole thing. Yep. Um, but that particular thing then said to learn more about this particular issue. Um, I did a podcast interview with this guy, Robin Wigglesworth. And Robin Wigglesworth is, a, is an author and an FT journalist. And it was all about, he, that, that was about that story. Yep. So if somebody, so if, if 500,000 people read that post, a certain percentage of them would then follow it through and go to the podcast. And in fact, that particular podcast episode, because again, it's all data and analytics driven, is our single biggest, um, uh, most popular podcast in terms of downloads. Yep. And what it, did, what it did though, was it was it effectively backed up. It's all kind of, it, you know, the, the, you can join the dots because it supports our investment proposition. The the Warren Buffett story leads to a podcast interview with a with an author who's written a best selling book, and that book supports our investment proposition. So, if you like all those things, you know, let's have a conversation. I love it. That's I love kind it. Of how it works. Um, and I, look, I, I think one thing I've really taken from from this, and also from your recommendations, is you 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 seem to approach this as you're not trying to create a four course meal or a degustation menu it's it's like a it's a, it's like a tasting plate a little bit here a little bit there a little cheese and whatever and 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 spit by bit people get to know you and next thing you know they come into the office and they're like i already know what you do i know who i, just, I want to talk to you about yeah. doing something yeah kind of and what what you begin to realize uh, over time is this magical thing called algorithms you know platform algorithms you know we've got some of the smartest people on the planet out in silicon valley and their sole purpose is to keep people on the platform not because yeah. they like me or you but because they want to sell something advertising clicks whatever you wherever you want to whatever you want to talk about so in the past we've all been i've certainly been a victim of the algorithm you know i start scrolling stuff and i read more stuff and then before i know i've lost an hour of my life because i've read some or watched some youtube video or something like that i think it's quite interesting so the challenge <laughs> is to flip that around yeah. is to use the algorithms for our own benefit. And what you realize quite quickly is if somebody, that's why people say to me, God, every time I go on LinkedIn, I see your posts up there. It's because you've clicked the previous ones. Yeah. The algorithm has said, oh, this person likes this. They have no idea what the content actually is, but they've said this person likes it. So we're going to always put the top of their feed, the same content or the, so if this creator, me in this case, writes another article, the next time you go on LinkedIn, you'll see that. Other people won't see it because they'll be well, not, or inter not interested. So that's that's fine. So the thing is about creating a system. So people say, how do you find the time to do this? You just build a system. So I, I just I use scheduling tools. I, the one I use is called Hootsuite, and you can I just I, I just constantly think of things. There's a, there's another there's a there's a book which I highly recommend. Uh, it's called Show Your Work. A guy called Austin Cleon. Austin Cleon. Again, yeah, I read that about a year ago. And it just, it just says all the stuff, it said what I just said, all the stuff that you come across that you experience, um, show your work, just share it with the world. Mm. Because, you know, and if 99% of people think, well, that's dull and uninteresting and boring, then wonderful. Um, then if 1% of people think this is really quite interesting, it's so relevant to what I'm doing or what I need or what I'm kind of interested in, then that 1% will see that stuff. So you show your work. And so I'm constantly thinking of, because I've got the mindset now since I did Ship 30 to think, all right, what else is going on the other that the world might find? You've got to constantly think, I, you know, as often I'll think of posting something, I think, well, that's 
bullshit. That's boring. If you constantly put a filter of value, someone somewhere might find this helpful. They might not have understood it. Just say, is this going to offer somebody, at least one person, some value? Yes or no? If no, don't bother. I mean, you can't do that every time. Sometimes you just want to talk about some other things on your mind. But if it's going to uh, resonate, then offer value. So I just use a, a Google Sheets and I think about something and I just write that, no, or Google Doc. And I just write it down. And probably once a week, I sit down, I just schedule. I say, right. And that's the other thing that I learned from these courses consistency. So I try to schedule things to drop at about 8 a.m. most mornings. So I try to post one thing a day. So yep. it should be about the same time every day and, and just sort of drop it out. And then, and then you use the, the great thing about particularly Twitter is you get instant feedback. You'll think, well, I've got this brilliant thing I'm going to share with the world. And you post it and it's like crickets. <laughs> no one's interested. You think, well, actually, it's not. maybe it's not quite so brilliant just because I thought it was. And then you post some other random nonsense that you think, well, this is just yeah. fun. And it just kind of goes viral. You think, well, this is very interesting. So then double down on that. Again, there's a whole ecosystem for that. So, so Twitter is your testing ground because you just, it takes, you know, it's all by its very nature, although you can post longer form ones now, but I like posting very short form thoughts or concepts or ideas. Find the ones that resonate and then create longer form. Maybe that becomes double a LinkedIn down. post. Maybe that, maybe that can build onto your... Uh, and the other thing I would say, and this other thing I've been doing over the over the past little while, is building my own email list. Because one thing we know about, you can spend a lot of time and effort creating your personal profile and all the rest of it. And then, I mean, God knows what's going on. What's not called Twitter anymore, is it? So whatever Elon decides to do next week might just change everything. <laughs> and yeah, so true. it's quite good to have, you know, build your own platform. So I'm sort of taking some of the audience away through an email list. Uh, I haven't started writing the emails yet or the newsletters, but building a you know a, some some other content through another medium that i've got more control over they say in, in market in email marketing it, the money's in the list and email's not going away so if you build a list yeah. you've got direct line um i want to I, I know we're running a bit short of time but i wanted to i wanted to ask you about the podcasting and i also want to ask you quickly yeah. um did the did did the what you were doing on twitter did the habit you'd built lead to the podcast or were they completely separate things it, it, it was all kind of part of the same, uh, you know, thinking, so this, the same process. Um, they, they came from different places, but it was just, the, it, it was the idea of creating content out there. It, and again, so I go right back to, 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 to basics. When I said, mentioned earlier on, got a company, believe in what we do, convinced we add value, know we add value, get feedback, want to still grow the business. Yeah, we want to make we want to make a bigger impact, and it's not really about let's make all make ourselves rich or richer or, or or have more money. It's about it genuinely is about making a positive impact. I mean, I mean, every one of my team will stand by that. So, how do we do it? And we've tried multiple methods. That's what it, that's where it comes from. It comes yeah. from trial and trial and error. You know, as I said, as I said before, you know, wasted breakfast meetings with you know, random people uh, with, 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 with the intent of growing the business. So I more and more got interested in the concept of content creation and content marketing. Right. And I use myself as the test case. I listen to podcasts. I mean, that's an interesting thing because I'm not a big, I'm not, I mentioned YouTube earlier on, but I'm not a big YouTube viewer. I don't watch a lot. Of, I, know, so I know other people do watch a lot of YouTube videos and I don't. And the reason that I don't is because I'm I'm static when I'm doing it. I can't do other things. I like the podcast yeah, as a med a medium. I can go for a walk and go to the gym and drive and do various other things whilst consuming that content. And so for I'm me fine. personally, and, and and it's the same. And I'm I, you know that's why I'm not on Instagram producing content because I don't really watch. I don't read it myself. So I just replicate. And maybe it's just, just a selfish thing. I listen to podcasts. I read Twitter, I read LinkedIn, don't know much, much of anything else. Yep, so I think that's an, I think it's an important thing um, not to try and, try and spread yourself too thin. My audience, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist on TikTok. My ideal future audience doesn't. It might do in the future. I don't know. But right now, that's where the, the people hang out digitally. I like the concept. I consume a lot of podcasts. I just like it. I like finding new ones and interesting ones. Yep. And I just came from the concept of, I mean, my own, the, the Bulletproof Entrepreneur literally started, and again, it's another, it's another COVID dividend. You just got more, more time and I'm consuming podcasts then. And I would, and I still do, I sit in coffee shops, meeting rooms, you name it, with business owners. Yeah. And I have, I'm, I mean, everyone is a financial planner on this call would relate to this. We have really interesting conversations. And going back to my earlier point, if you ask meaningful questions about people, 
and they share their story, their personal mm. journey. It's fascinating. You know, you mm. just, nobody I've ever spoken to is that as an easy ride. No one said, well, you know, start a business and we just made millions and we sold it for tens of millions and we all get happily ever after. There are trials and tribulations. It's a classic hero's journey. Yeah. Set off in, 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 you know, with, with a, you know, an, an, a, an honorable mission or a vision, what we're trying to achieve. They were thwarted. There was battles to fight, and hopefully they succeeded and came on the other side of it. And I would sit in rooms, and you know, people would share their entrepreneur journey with me. And often I would say, "God, the value you've just shared with me is just incredible." If we just set a microphone up and had the conversation, we shared it with other people. There would be value to be created on other people. I honestly started the podcast not as a as a sort of business generating tool. I thought maybe at some point you might get a few people who might listen to it and think that's quite interesting. Mm. I honestly did it because I wanted to do it. I, I, I wanted to test myself. Could I, could I do this? But I honestly thought, you know, the, the kind of the world of the business owner and particularly the entrepreneur and that person who's decided to go and set, you know, the, the, it's not an easy route. You know, it's, it is easier to be an employee of a large corporate and get paid your salary and go home on a Friday night, and not think about work. Yep. So the, the trials and tribulations of the business owner are something I wanted to document and I want to share. So if, if I'm speaking to people who have kind of successfully, you know, concluded at least one part of that journey and they've, they've sold up and they've sort of banked life-changing sums of money, there are people behind them on the journey and they would 100%. love to learn, learn from them. And the more I've had a few quite high profile people on the podcast, but interestingly, the more popular down, numbers of downloads are people who are our clients, the kind of, you know, regular regular people, regular business owners that others can relate to. So that's, that's what I, and again, everything was an experiment. I said, well, let's just, let's just, let's do a handful of episodes, see what happens. And the other thing that I would just share with anyone that's showing up again, this is obvious, but it's, but it's not easy is consistency. Yeah. When I, mean, I read it, I, I, I had a statistic the other day that if one, if you release 21 episodes of a podcast, you are now in the top 1% of all podcasts ever yeah, right. created. That most, right. podcasts, most podcasts never get past three or four. Yeah. Ever, it starts, sounds like a good idea. And then people realize, oh, it's a bit of a faff. Nothing much is happening. I'm not getting inundated with new business. So I said from the beginning, and it's still, I'm still on track, I'm going to do 100 episodes and then see what yeah. happens from there. So everything should be a small experiment. And podcasting Love now it. is very simple. I, mean, I think we've got at least one member of my esteemed trap uh, cohort on the call with us uh, right now Who and knows? so that's a different book that, that was another idea that started a little bit after my own one which again started from a bunch of us you know there's four of us on the real advisor podcast trap um who were just friends you know in real life and we meet up and we go to the pub or we go for dinner and we have chats and we just get the same sort of thing we were in a little trip over to ireland a year ago and we just sat around in a restaurant just you know, chewing the fat but we always talk about business and sure. we said, we should, we should just, if we again put a microphone on this table, and I think that podcast, the Real Advisor podcast comes across, people tell us that it's like a bunch of guys meeting in a bar, just talking about our business. Some of the best podcasts I feel are fly on the wall because you get an opportunity to have a, have a ringside seat into a bunch of people who are interesting. You never otherwise would get to hear. And I think Tim Ferriss is like that. Joe Rogan's yeah. is built on that. Now, Alan, I'm, 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 I'm keen to keep going. If you are, I don't know whether you've got anything coming I'm, up. I'm fine. Oh, um, but I also know there's people, you know, they might be getting ready to have fa- dinner with their family or maybe get ready for work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, before, before I go, if someone um, likes the Cuddy Jib and wants to find out more or wants to, you know, what's a good next step they can, they can do? What, what, what's something you'd like to put out there? Well, if, if someone hasn't listened to, again, I, th- I think uh, the audience is mainly people in our profession, financial professionals of one description or another. Um, do check out the Real Advisor podcast trap on all podcast platforms of your choice and on youtube i said from the day one it had to be video <laughs> uh, but uh, and the thing about the uh, trap is it's we do we we do no editing for it so it is a bit raw it's a bit basic but i do believe it, it's been very successful it'll be mu- much more successful than we thought it was going to be initially yep. so check that out check out the real advisor podcast we've done 20 something episodes now and within I, I believe within each one there's just some i think it works because there's four of us and we've got we agree on a lot of things we disagree on some things and so you do get some yeah you do you do get some sort of conflicting views on things which is which is the idea if we all agreed on everything it'd be really boring so yeah so check check that out um and my, my other podcast is the bulletproof entrepreneur anyone who's running a business would learn loads from me just interviewing successful business owners over the years and obviously i'm on linkedin and twitter if anyone wants to sort of engage directly uh, with me happy to do that absolutely um 
I just wanted to uh, quickly, David, you asked if there's a pre-recording. Uh, we This will go out as a, a, podca- a podcast episode on the Finnovator, which is my podcast, um, But you can, and it'll also go on YouTube. But we, we'll also put it on, if you go to our website, which is audere, A-U-D-E-R-E.com.au, you can sign up for our uh, free best, ma- best practice management portal, and we put a copy of that, as with all of our masterclasses on there, if you wanted to grab it. So just in case you have to leave it early and you want to know to pick up on the rest of the conversation. Cool. Um. So I'm really interested. Um, I mean, we can talk about podcasting a bit more, but where, where, what are you doing next? I mean, there's so much you've done. You're in a position now where you've you've got a business where you, it gives you the freedom. You know, you've got that kind of um, what's that about a boy thing with uh, Hugh Grant, where he's got an empty sort of di- diary. What do you do? Yeah. Where where do you see you know the next um, leap forward for you and for the business? Um. It's kind of it's, it's it's more of the same, but but better, I think. So everything, all roads lead back to my, my my the filter through which I see everything is is the concept is is our is our vision, and it just keeps coming back to this: how can we help more people? That's 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 our our main thing. So we'll we'll continue to grow this business. We'll continue to help more families. We'll continue to show up and uh, and you know, and, and do the basics. And I got the. I've got a strong feeling that you know we've we've got some, this more, even more sort of new legislation that's come out in the UK in the last week or so, called consumer duty. And I, I, I just the sense I've got is that the world is moving farther, more and more towards boutique businesses. Is what I'm calling the, the smaller owner managed type company, and away from the large corporate. Yeah. It comes back to this idea of we are in the relationship business. We are in the human being business versus the investment management business. Yeah. The investment management is, you know, the, the whole industry in the UK alone is a seven trillion pound business, which is the retail investment management business across pension funds and everything else. And the money is to be made in fund management historically. And I think slowly but surely the world is waking up to the fact that it's there's much more to it than that. And whether, whether you choose fund A or fund B, it's not only really going to make a huge difference in your life. Um, what's important is identifying what a, a you know a life well lived looks like, and working with a sort of trusted advisor to help you achieve all the things that's important to you and your family. So the the world that I operate in and, and the people that I sort of hang out with and know, we've been saying this for years, but we've been sort of you know, barking at the moon effectively because the world hasn't really understood this because we're up against the weight of the this global asset management industry that tells the world that you should, what you should be interested in is investing in fund A because it's better yeah. than fund B. But slowly but surely, I just got, you know, some of the new people that knock on our door and want to become clients have been historically clients of these large corporates and they've sort of, they've seen the light. So I'm very positive about the future direction of businesses like mine and the others, yeah. the many who, uh, who are on this call and I can't end, I can't sort of finish a conversation about anything about the future without talking about those two magic letters, A and I. Because the stuff <laughs> and I've got, again, you know, re- reflecting what I mentioned before, my shiny new objects, magpie mentality, you know, this was a wonderful new object for me to get into. When I first started understanding, I've gone deep in the weeds on, on AI. And if there is a sector right for disruption through what AI can achieve, um, more than any others, I believe it's financial services. Okay. Because we are, we are right at the cut. If you think about what we actually do, we, we create, we're, we're very much in the, in the numbers game. We're doing, I mean, I, you know, I cringe a little bit. Look at some of the stuff that we do, manual labor with Excel spreadsheets and manipulating money, um, your data, and moving yep. figures around. And it's kind of a laborious process, but it's a part of the work that we, we do. And then we sort of convert all that kind of data aspects and we put it into the written word and we create you know you know long relatively boring documents for people to consume and read and that's just a transfer of data transfer of information from us to our clients and prospective clients and and ai does all that you know ai just excels at pardon the pun but excels at numbers and manipulating data and organizing data and organizing words and the written word and visuals and video. And so the opportunities that exist for financial planners to embrace and optimize their businesses for the future to really enhance. and I think we have the opportunity. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but I still say for a huge industry, the technology that exists in financial services is pretty poor relatively. We're, we're still sort of scratching around and systems that don't really talk to each other, rekeying data. Etc. The opportunities, and I've spent quite a lot of time um, in this, um, 
in the last, you know, for, for since, you know, really since the beginning of this year. So it's only sort of six, seven months, but yeah. quite a lot of time understanding um, the opportunities that exist and, 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 and testing out some of the, uh, the new tech that's now available to us. And I'm really excited about it. So I think we can continue to, to scale our business, to grow a business, to attract and develop our, our you know, new, new clients. Um, but we can just do it far more efficiently and effectively. And what that does is it just makes life better for everyone. Yeah. You know, I've got in my, my, my colleagues here, my team, really good people, talented, talented people that are just doing work, which is pretty you know, mind numbing because it has to be done. It's manual labor effectively, but so you know, sit in a darkened room and just, you know, crunch some numbers. Yeah. But if we can get the machines to do all that, um, you know, faster, lower cost, more effectively, than um, humans. And we can be focused on the unique part of our role, which is uniquely human, happy yeah. days. Happy days for our, my colleagues, happy days for our clients. I agree. Really, really good. I mean, and I, I think what the, the advisors or, and, and often the big large corporates who focus a lot on the numbers and the data and fund performance and charts and graphs and their view of the markets, what the market's going to do, they're kind of, that's, no one cares about that. And the machines will do it faster and better than anyone else. And it's a real, it's a, not everyone is good at doing this. Not everyone is great at building relationships with clients and building rapport and asking great questions and caring about the answers. So I think firms like our, ours, and there's plenty of others like us who really focus on the human side of things, will excel in the next number of years. We'll do super, super well because mm. we're already pretty, pretty good at it. We'll get better at it. We'll have more time to do that. If we can have just create more time to have higher quality conversations with our clients and future clients, it's, it's more enjoyable for every single part of our, our experience from, as I say, from our team to our clients, to our, you know, our community and everyone around us. Matt, I and love that. Create more, more, more time to build, to create more podcasts. Who knows? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I often talk about the fact that um, we're at a really interesting place in the advice space and whether you come at it from a global thing. And I look at fitness and you go back 40 years ago, fitness was just rich people, right? And suddenly it, it went through this evolution to now fitness is available. It's something that everybody... Everybody invests in and they do it. And ultimately, what it is, 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 is basically going and sweating and hurting and being in pain. But everybody's realized that this is part, this is part of creating a better life. And I think people are getting, coming to this realization now that getting advice about your money, which could, money yeah. can be the number one thing that creates misery or it can create freedom and get working Absolutely. with people and, and, and treating it the same way you do your fitness and well-being. That's where we're heading. I, I, I can't, like, I think once we get the tech right and we get the efficiency, I think we're, we're on the cusp of a golden age. I really do. I agree with every everything you've, yeah. you've put out there today. Yeah, yeah. Alan, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, and I've got, I've got my full page of notes, but I think the one thing, uh, probably two things I really take from this is, I feel like so much of your success and what you've done is, is ultimately about seeking to build relationships and connection. And yeah. the second thing is, right from the very moment I, I met you, you are just curious and you, you want to learn, you want to know and you want to share and you want to put it out there. And I, I think, you know, there's two things to take away from that. I think those are the two things I would take away personally. Yeah, absolutely. I hope it's been of some help. It has got everybody. Can you do me a quick favor? Just head over to the chat box because um, I have an above, above average need for feedback. Can you just tell me what, what's one thing that you've taken from, from this discussion today that you think has been most useful or most valuable or you can implement? Uh, I'd love to know. Nick says it was all awful. No, he doesn't. He didn't say that. Just pop in the chat box. So one thing so we can just sort of reflect on it. Uh, <laughs> Nick says it's not just us that have trouble stopping him in full flow. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a good flow. Um, uh, Dara, Dara, am I pronouncing that right? Dara. Uh, Dara, yeah. Dara, yeah. I know cool. Dara. Great, great guy Consist from Ireland, yeah. Consistency is key with everything. Mike, uh, best use of your time. Work out the best. Yeah. I mean, if you get to that certain point, that's, that's, a, that's a given. Uh, what else we got? Come, keep it coming through. Just turn up, says Nick. Yep, got to be there. Uh, Marcus says discipline equals freedom. Oh, Jocko Willink. Yeah. Yeah. Discipline yeah. Is Jocko. I love Jocko. I love the way he looks and the way he talks and what comes out of his mouth. He's fantastic. But, Me, but, look, but look at him. Another, another example of just a content creator. You know, he's, he's a, well, an, an ex Navy SEALs or something guy, but, and there's, but there's thousands of them, but he just shows up and he delivers they, and he shares his information and he, who do you think be interested in what he's, but you know, one of the most successful podcasts in the world now. Dave Goggins. He's another one. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, meaningful conversations. Greg says the three things, simplicity, the share, share your workbook and Twitter is a testing ground. Yeah. Elizabeth, welcome. Give yourself time to think about how to do stuff. 
Andrew is be consistent with online marketing. Consistency is everything. Uh, yeah. Stuart's consistently not perfection. 100% that's a good one. Uh, Nick, the 21 episodes thing, being in the top 1% is insane. I agree. That is insane. <laughs> but that's the whole thing about being uh, reaching the top at something is actually much, much easier than people realize compared to um, just doing a consideration stepping back from the advisor role. Jonathan's be authentic and personable. Marcus showing I love it. Guys, thank you so much, guys and girls. Apologies. Final thoughts, Al. Al? Sorry, Alan. Al. <laughs> Al. <laughs> That, that works. I mean, the, the only sort of final thoughts that I've <laughs> is, is without this, this is not sort of fake humility. This is a kind of, if I, if I can, you know, God, not as if I'm there, there are people million times more successful than, than, than I am or we are, but we've done okay. We've done okay from, you know, modest, but, um, you know, humble origins and all, all the rest of it. Um, but the, the big thing is just don't over, don't overthink this. Be, you know, I have over that. I've learned all the ways of not doing things. I, you know, I wrote an article last year, failing my way to success, because my God, have I done some crazy stuff and got up some dead ends and wasted a lot of time. Um, so I, I think my, my, my thoughts are do give yourself time to think about this. What is your vision? What is an idea? You know, we deliver financial planning and, you know, good outcomes for our clients. What is it for you? What does a good life look like for you? Is it you're on the tools dealing with dealing with your clients every day? If so, wonderful. But if you want to continue to grow, you might have to bring other people in. You don't even have nowadays. You don't even have to hi- have to hi- you know hire them on the payroll as such. You can outsource a lot of the other activities. But you've got to be intentional. So I think that's one one key thing: is be intentional. Be really super clear about what you want to do, and what you know. T- describe your ideal life three years out, for example, five yeah. years out, for example. I wouldn't go any further than that because God knows what will happen. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as, as has been mentioned by a lot of the people on, on, on the, uh, this call, consistency, you know, what is it you're going to do every day in order to give yourself the highest possible opportunity of achieving that ideal outcome? And last but not least, simplify. Don't over-engineer it. Don't try to be on every single platform. Do you choose one or two platforms if you're going to create content uh, and show up every day and, and deliver it. So those are the things I would say. You, you do that with any level of consistency, you've got the highest possible chance of achieving your, you know, what good looks like for you. You know what? If it wasn't stapled to my ear, I would do a mic crop right now because that was excellent. <laughs> thank you very um, much. Thank you so thank much you for your time, Alan. It's always a pleasure. And um, hopefully I get to sort of meet you in the flesh in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're over in, the, over in the UK. So um, it's first, yeah. time in, well, first time in 14 years. Wow. Okay. I know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm well, half well, thinking well, they're well, going to well, take, well, take my take my passport when I arrive, just just as penance. <laughs> but um, thanks again, everybody. And uh, reminder: head over if you haven't heard it before. Head over and, and check out the uh, the Real Advice podcast and the Bulletproof Entrepreneur. Other than that, Alan, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks very much. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.